Well, welcome again to another Friday night. We're continuing our series on reparenting ourselves in this journey of healing from trauma. And the need to parent ourselves is all about learning new tools, building a safe support network, dealing with all kinds of different situations and figuring out the right tools. And today, I want to talk about darkness. Every parent has to help a child who develops a fear of the dark. And they have to help a child learn to not be afraid of the dark, how to approach the dark. It's just part of parenting. And why to me it's important to talk about in reparenting is because for many people with complex trauma, the dark is not a good place. To them, the dark is nothing but negative because lots of bad stuff happened in the dark. It became a very scary place that still generates a ton of fear. And for a lot of people with complex trauma, they developed a fear of a monster under their bed and their parents never helped them work that through. And then they had, were attacked in the night, lots of bad things happened in the night, sexual abuse, etc. And so now, nighttime is scary. They can't sleep unless they have a light on. They sleep with their back to the wall. They sleep with a weapon close by. All because darkness to them is something that has never brought anything good, only bad. It's all about added danger to their life. And what I really want to look at today is can darkness ever be a good thing? Is there a good kind of darkness? And I hope I can help you think this through and hopefully bring some healing to what you've gone through in the past. So what I'm going to do is really talk about darkness in two ways. Literal darkness, so what happens outside at night, and metaphorical darkness. And to me, this is really important to break it into these two distinctions. So literal darkness we get. Nighttime. The sun is gone, the moon is out, or the moon is covered. It's dark outside. Now, I am grateful that I grew up in a family where my Parents taught me to be cautious at dark time and going outside because there were dangers, but they didn't teach me to be afraid of the dark. In fact, they taught me that, yes, there's things that can go wrong in the dark and you need to be cautious, but there's wonderful things, benefits that can come from darkness. And I have many, many pleasant memories of being out in the dark away from the city, looking up and seeing northern lights, seeing comets streaking across the star, sky, looking at the stars and all of their beauty, watching the reflection of the moon on a lake, seeing fireflies, sitting around a campfire at night, all kinds of things that were positives that came out of darkness. It's not just complex trauma that causes some people to see darkness as negative. I think we're living at a time where our culture is doing everything it can to avoid darkness. We now have lights going all night long so that some areas in our cities never experience darkness. And it's like darkness is seen as bad. We need to get rid of it by creating artificial light everywhere. And then for some children, if they have fear of the dark, parents just say, turn on a light, sleep with the light on. They don't help them have any other tools to deal with the darkness other than turn on a light. And so that becomes darkness scares me, turn on light. That's the only way of dealing with that. But hopefully, I've said enough already that you can realize, okay, not all darkness is bad. But I want to take it further in just a minute to see some of the good pieces to darkness. 
But first, let me come to this metaphor of darkness. So the metaphor of darkness can get used in different ways. From anything that's dangerous, that's dark, anything that's scary or negative. I'm in a dark emotional place. I'm in a dark psychological place. It can even be used to talk about evil. That's dark wrong, etc. So darkness is used as a metaphor for anything that scares us, anything we want no part of, because we're sure we don't have the resources to survive it, or we don't want to find out. In my own life, I often use synonyms for darkness. So darkness, that dark time in my life, I often can refer to as I'm in a desert period or I'm in the winter season in my life. And it refers to, I'm in a time where conditions are extreme. Conditions are pushing me to the edge of my endurance. They're adding extra stress. There are times where I just feel very vulnerable. So that's kind of the darkness metaphor. Now, I have found it so helpful to realize that about 500 years ago, people who thought about this made a distinction between two types of metaphorical darkness. So the first was darkness that was evil. And so today we would say darkness that is evil could be addiction or being with a person who is an evil person a person who's created a toxic environment, an unsafe environment. That's, that's darkness that you got to get out of. That's darkness that is wrong. That's darkness that is hurting you, that is hurting others. Or we could refer to darkness as feeling that darkness inside of me, temptation pulling me into wrong, unhealthy behaviors that are going to hurt me and others. So that's the metaphorical darkness that would be evil. And so that kind of darkness requires good internal boundaries, good external boundaries. It requires vigilance. It requires connecting to healthy people and building a life with healthy people that help you resist that darkness. It requires feeding my soul healthy things that help me resist that darkness. So that that's that subject. That's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on the second type that has been identified, which they called obscurity darkness. Darkness that isn't evil or bad, it's just times in life when it's hard to see, when things are obscure. Some refer it to being in a dark night of the soul. And so for some in a spiritual way, that could be all of a sudden they just feel spiritual depression. They don't feel as close to their higher power. It could be that. But for others, that darkness of obscurity is you're in a time when your mental health isn't good. Your mental state isn't good. And you're not finding anything to help it. Or it could be a time where you just feel isolated from people. And so you start ask, questioning everything about life. Nothing makes sense anymore. Things that used to work aren't working anymore. It's a confusing time. All of a sudden you don't know your, what my purpose is. And, and so why am I here is, is a question that comes up with that. Very existential questions about the meaning of life. Belonging can come up. So those times everybody goes through. That's what I want you to see. Times that are confusing, disillusioning, full of questions with no answers. Times where you feel like all of your anchors you're severed from. You feel on a stormy sea and you've lost your compass and you don't have an anchor, and it's just a dark time, an obscure time, a confusing time. But here's what I want you to see. Yes, it's scary, confusing, it can be dangerous, 
but the design of those obscure dark nights of the soul is healing, growth. And that's what I want to focus on, is these obscure dark nights. And the purpose, the positive purpose in our lives. So let me go back to positive purpose of literal darkness. Why do we need nighttime? Well, so much understanding has been gained by understanding our circadian rhythm. And basically, it's working, sleeping, working, sleeping. And what they find is it matches darkness and light. So when the sun comes up, something in us wakes up and comes alive and we work. When the sun goes down, something in us starts to want to go to sleep. So our bodies are designed to get work and rest based on when the sun is up and when the sun is down. The next thing they have found is most of us need deep darkness to sleep well. We don't sleep as well if it's half light, if there's lots of different lights flickering around us. We need darkness to sleep well, and that is important because we need good sleep to be healthy. If we don't get consistent good sleep, it starts to affect our health. So darkness is essential to being healthy. We need darkness as much as we need light, is what they are finding out. Take that further in the language of complex trauma and how we're designed, is we have a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system. They work in balance. The sympathetic is the energy, productivity, survival. It takes a lot of resources. And we will burn out if we overuse it and get sick. We need the parasympathetic to be in balance and to operate to bring healing and restoration and rest so that our bodies are healthy. Our parasympathetic operates and is triggered often by night. We need night for the parasympathetic to get the time it needs to bring balance and rest to our bodies. So darkness is just as important as light if we are to be healthy. So, if physical darkness is essential to being healthy, then maybe metaphorical darkness is essential to being healthy. So let's go back to that. What are types of metaphorical darkness? And this is really important to understand. So the first type of metaphorical darkness are those times of loss, where you lose somebody very dear to you. Now why I put it in this category is this, that losing somebody very dear to you is a loss you don't get over quickly. It takes a lot of time. But more than that, because they're so dear to you, there were attachments that were lost. There were things you relied on them that were lost. So when you lose them, it radically changes your life. It throws everything into a different place. And that can result in a lot of confusion. So you're not just dealing with the loss and the grief of the loss of the person. Maybe you've lost your security as well. Maybe you've lost your main person who guided you and gave you wisdom. So you've lost a whole bunch of things just in losing that person. And now, how do you get that back? It's very confusing. And so life is no longer neat and tidy. Life is obscure. And so a big loss of a significant person can throw people into a time of obscurity and darkness. But there's a second type of loss that is so important to understand, and it's losing not just a healthy attachment, which we just talked about, 
but losing an unhealthy attachment. Now, let me explain it this way. Attachment, what we're beginning to realize, it is just the first most essential need that every person has. A child comes into the world, they need to attach. Everything in, their, in the child is driven to attach. And so they're designed to attach to mom and dad, to human beings who will love them, who will meet their need. So they're driven to attach because they're helpless to survive on their own. They need to attach to somebody more powerful than them who loves them, who can meet their needs, who has resources in order to survive. So they're driven to attach. But then they're going to find other things, food, sex, toys, that give them pleasure. And they're going to attach to them. But if their attachment with mom and dad is the main attachment and is strong and healthy, then they will develop a healthy attachment to the toys, to food. They won't overdo it. It will be in balance. It will have boundaries. And mom and dad will help them do that so that they will use tools, toys, food, all of those things but they won't look to them to be the main source of their life because mom and dad are that. The problem then is complex trauma. A child doesn't grow up with a healthy attachment to mom and dad. Mom and dad are abusive. Mom and dad are too busy. Mom and dad have their own problems and can't give time to connect with the child. So the child doesn't experience the deepest longing and need of their life to attach to mom and dad. Doesn't make that longing go away. So now they find food. Now they find sex. Now they find toys. And they attach to them and they give pleasure. They satisfy their limbic brain. They make them feel good. And so what happens is the child now says, I will attach to food. That will become my main cause of happiness. I will attach to sex. I will attach to this activity. So instead of attaching to people, they attach to things, activities, or unhealthy people. And those become their main attachments. But the problem is, is when you have unhealthy attachments... At first, they deliver pleasure. At first, they seem to fix all your problems. At, seem, at first, they seem to make life worth living, but they don't truly satisfy. They don't truly meet the need. And so pretty soon, they start to give pleasure with some emptiness, pleasure with some pain. And then after a while, they get more and more pain, more and more emptiness, less and less pleasure. You become addicted to them. Our first response to that is denial. I don't want to believe that this thing that once made my life satisfying is no longer delivering. No, no. It's still giving a little bit of pleasure. It's still a good thing. I, it, I can't come around to say it's a bad thing. I can't come around to think about I got it all wrong. No, no. I'm going to deny all of that. And we continue on trying to make this thing work but it keeps delivering less and less pleasure, more and more emptiness and pain. That finally breaks through all of our denial and we hit a point where we go, whoa, I built my life on an unhealthy attachment. I built my life on the wrong thing. Now what do I do? All that I thought was so clear and so right, now I see is so wrong. Now you're in obscurity. Now you're in disillusionment. Now you're in a dark night. Because what all made sense and seemed to work before no longer works and no longer makes sense, and you don't know what to do to find a healthy life. What I want you to see is you see how necessary that is if you're ever going to get healthy? You had to go through that obscurity, that dark night, 
in order to leave behind those unhealthy attachments, in order to eventually find a healthy life. It wasn't fun. It was painful. It was dark. But it, it's a process. It's a pathway that leads back to the light. That becomes an essential part of this. There's a second type of metaphorical obscure darkness. And it's not just difficult times, but it's extremely difficult times that go on for an extended period of time. So you have health problems that just keep going on. You have mental health problems that just keep going on. You have financial or job problems that just keep going on and they get worse and worse and you have less and less money and more and more pressure. You have relationship problems that just drag on and on and get worse and worse. You have problems with a child that just keep getting worse. What happens in these extended problems is at first we think we know the solution to the problem. We know why we have that problem. We diagnose it. We come up with the solution. That solution didn't work. We thought it would be a quick fix. So we go to option B. Well, that, then this is going to work. That doesn't work. We go to option C. We go to option D. We go to option E. Then we go on the internet. We start looking for other possible solutions to this problem. We try every possible solution we can find for this problem, and it still is there. It has not yet been fixed. That takes us to a dark night. Life is no longer clear. We no longer have it figured out. Now we don't have the answers. Now we got thousands of questions and no solution. It is painful. It is confusing. We feel disillusioned. We feel that maybe nothing works. That is a very dark time, and it leads most to a place of feeling so hopeless, so helpless, Everything has changed, and they do not have a clue how to improve it. So that's a tarp type of dark night. Then we can bring darkness on ourselves. And there's, we do it in two ways. First, we can bring darkness on ourselves through burnout. So we talked about our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So people in complex trauma, people who got their validation from always working hard, always producing, they can work their sympathetic nervous system all the time and rarely work their parasympathetic nervous system. And eventually they burn themselves out. Eventually their body says, I refuse to continue to cooperate with you abusing me. I am going to start to shut down. But what happens for a person like that is they've built their whole life, all of their sense of purpose, all of their sense of validation on this very simple formula of push yourself, go, go, produce, help, serve. All of that falls apart now. Now they sit there and go, who am I? What am I good at if I'm not able to do anything? Do I have any value? What is my purpose in life? Maybe I'm just a failure. It is a dark, confusing time, but they brought it on themselves, not just because they burned themselves out, but they built their life on the wrong foundation in the first place of gaining their value from the wrong things, which that could have come out of their complex trauma, not feeling they had value in the first place, their shame. So those lead to very dark nights but then there's a second way we bring it on ourselves. Many people are afraid of darkness. They run from the darkness. And that can come from a couple causes. So some people are part of families or systems of spirituality that basically give the message to people, you need to be happy all the time. You need to have the sun shining all the time. If you are healthy, if you are spiritual, you always will, the sun will always be shining. You will always be happy. You will always be positive. You always feel close to God. Everything will go well. It's a solar type of spirituality. It's a solar family system where the sun is always supposed to shine. So if you, the sun isn't shining, you're sad, 
you're struggling, then you're doing something wrong. You failed. It's not that our whole worldview is wrong. It's you must have failed. And so some people are afraid to look at their darkness and be honest about their darkness and go into their darkness because they would be, feel they would be saying, I have failed. And that would be terrible to have to admit. The second thing is for people who have come out of complex trauma, nothing good came out of going into darkness. Darkness was scary. Darkness always meant getting hurt. And so the fear is if I go into my darkness and look at my darkness and be honest about my darkness, it might be too much for me to handle. Bad stuff might happen that I can't handle and will overwhelm me and I'll get hurt again. So every time they start to feel the darkness nudging in, they run. That's their way of avoiding darkness. But here's what I want you to understand. We can run from darkness for a while, but it will eventually catch up to us because we'll wear ourselves out running from it. We have to, we're going to face it sooner or later. And what I am wanting you to understand is you can face it now. With support and tools and understanding, you can get through it. You can learn from it. It can be a positive experience. It won't overwhelm you. But for many, they fear that it will. Miriam Greenspan, who wrote the book Healing Through Dark, the Dark Emotions says this, what results in depression for some is not that they experience dark emotions. In other words, depression is not the direct result of dark emotions, but the real reason is that the person is unable to endure sitting in dark emotions. That's what leads to depression. This, not, this leads not only to being depressed, but to unhealthy ways of coping with these dark emotions. So not facing the darkness, not sitting in the darkness, leads to depression and all kinds of unhealthy coping things that even create greater darkness. So we need to learn how to handle the darkness. So before I get to that, let me first speak to what are the benefits of darkness. And I can honestly say this. I hate the dark times of my life, but the greatest lessons I've learned in life have come out of those dark times. My greatest growth in life has come out of darkness. And so, though I hate it, I'm thankful for it. Though I hate it, I love it. It's that weird dichotomy that darkness creates. What I have begun to realize is that times of darkness always have resulted in healing. That is their purpose. It causes me to wrestle with things I don't want to wrestle with. It causes me to wrestle with things that bring even more pain. And it feels like it's nothing about healing. It feels like it's actually tearing me down and making life worse. But if I wrestle through it, it always results in greater healing and growth. The next thing is that the darkness has helped me see some of the unhealthy attachments, some of the addictions, things I'm still looking to to make my life satisfying that are actually making it worse. Pieces of my foundation that are not solid, that are unhealthy, it's helped me begin to realize that and to figure out what a healthy foundation looks like. That's another healing thing. It's helped me deconstruct because in darkness I ask the most honest questions of myself, of life. I go through all the things I were taught was truth and I go, is it really truth? Is it really truth? This darkness is making me question. This darkness is making me doubt. And there's nothing wrong with doubts. There's nothing wrong with questions. It doesn't mean I'm a rebel. It doesn't mean I'm sliding backwards. It means I need to ask these questions so I can figure out the truth. 
Because if I have been given some lies, I want to know that. So darkness causes me to deconstruct, not just to tear things down, so that I can find the lies, the shaky foundation, and build even a stronger life and a stronger house. I have loved this reality about darkness, and that it's this, life begins in the dark. Do you realize that a fetus spends the first nine months in pitch blackness? Do you realize that a seed spends time below ground in darkness? New life always begins in the dark. And I think that's the same, the same is true for us. There's something else that to me is so important with darkness is it makes us more self-aware. We get more honest with ourselves. We see deeper layers of ourselves. We see attitudes and thoughts that have been triggered by the darkness that we didn't even know were there. Parts of our subconscious come to the conscious. It just leads to new levels of self-awareness. And, and what it helps me realize is that when light is always sunny, when the sun is always shining in my life, it's easy to get superficial. It's easy to not think deeply. It's easy to lie to myself, to not be honest with myself. It's easy to have distractions that, that help me not to go very deep. But darkness, it pushes me to get honest. It pushes me to go deep. And it leads to greater self-awareness. I see motives I've never seen before, we're honest about before. I see beliefs and flaws and attitudes much more clearly. Now I need to add this. As that self-awareness grows, often you see ugly stuff. Often you see parts of yourself that aren't so pretty. Don't beat yourself up for that. Maintain a self-compassion so that you can learn from it, so that you can change it. That is the way, right way through it. There's another, I think, important perspective. So Ken Wilbur is often seen as a great philosopher who's just a great thinker. And what he has done is identified that people who are in a very broken place need two things in order to get out of that place. And he calls it translation and transformation. And translation is basically in that very dark place, that very broken place where they feel very hopeless, they need somebody to come along who shines a light of hope. A light that says this is what your life could be. This is a better life that is available to you. And it gives the person hope. So they need a ray of light. And that is a positive message, a message that gives comfort and hope. But that, he says, that translation is just the very beginning of the journey out of that broken place. After you've got that translation, positive ray of light, hope message, then you need transformation. And transformation is the main part of the journey. Transformation where, is where you exit your old self. You dismantle that old self, that broken self. You deconstruct everything about it. And you get rid of everything that is unhealthy so that you can get to a healthier life. But it's a breaking down, a dismantling, a letting go. And guess what? You need disorienting darkness for a lot of that journey. So translation, you need light and hope. Transformation, you still need lights and hope to break through, but you need disorienting darkness at times to help you dismantle that old life, to help you let go of stuff, to help you deconstruct that old life. That is such a key part of the journey. There's another benefit to this metaphorical darkness. 
And that is it helps us learn to live better out of our cortex. So people out of complex trauma often struggle with the fact that their limbic brain is so powerful and their limbic brain has been so distorted it is not a reliable, helpful guide. It leads to impulsive, bad decisions. It can get triggered and lead to old behaviors. So they need to learn to live more out of their cortex. Easier said than done. One of the ways that helps us live out of our cortex better is times of darkness. So let me put it to you this way. If you live out of your limbic brain, there are going to be times where you just feel like loving your kids. You're going to be wanting to love your kids. You're going to be great at loving your kids. But what happens when you, oh, I don't feel like it. I, I just feel like being lazy today then your love to your kids is not consistent and it does damage to your kids because your limbic brain is deciding when to love based on how it's feeling. But what happens in times of darkness? You don't have any good limbic brain feelings. You don't feel like loving anybody. You just feel like isolating. You just feel like not being part of life. But yet you still have kids. You still have a partner. You know they need to be loved, so you've got to make a choice. And I'm going to choose to love them even though I don't feel like it. And if you do that every day, I, I choose again to, to love you even though I don't feel like it. I choose to listen to you. I choose to connect with you. I choose to do things with you. I choose to forgive you. I don't have one limbic brain thing making me want to, but I choose it over and over again. I learn to live out of my cortex. It builds character. It builds healthy habits of love. Somebody has said, what causes a tree to be strong? It's not just that the sun shines and it's warm and there's lots of water all the time. That would cause a tree to grow fast. What causes a tree to be strong is times of drought. Winter times, adversity, hard times, darkness. Because that causes it to grow slowly. That causes the wood to be harder than it is in those prosperous times. And so the strength of a tree comes out of the dark nights of the tree. That can be the same with humans as well. So let's end with just giving some tools for walking through darkness. So number one, set boundaries with people who think that unless your life is constantly sunny, it's your fault. You just need to not have those people chirping in your ear. Secondly, accept that you will have times of darkness. Get past the lie that you should have sunny all the time as part of your life. Third, develop self-compassion. Don't beat yourself up that you're struggling. Don't beat yourself up that you're in this time of darkness. Be very kind to yourself. Fourth, don't expect instant fixes, instant answers. You may get some, but you might be in this time of darkness for a while. Accept that it isn't going to get solved right away. You may sit with a whole bunch of unanswered questions. That's part of darkness. Fifth one, so important, keep your heart open. You see, darkness feels like danger. What happens for most people as their first fight, flight, freeze, survival response in danger? Close your heart. Then you do all the external shield activities, but you close your heart first. And so what happens to many people as soon as they enter darkness? Close your heart. Don't open up to anybody's love. Don't open up to connect with anybody. That is not a good response. Keep your heart open. So important. Next one, be willing to deconstruct your life. Darkness kind of forces you to have to. And you might feel guilty. You might feel disloyal. 
Enter into that. It will lead to good results. But connect with somebody who's gone through that kind of darkness. Somebody who gets it. Somebody who's farther down the road. Somebody who can encourage you, who can help you think it through. Meet with others regularly. Connect with people. That's an important part. You're not going to feel like it, but connect with people who get it. People who will support you. Read books. Watch movies or documentaries of people who have gone through dark nights. That's going to help you. Keep meeting your 12 needs. Make sure that even though you're struggling, you're in a dark place, you're still taking care of yourself. Learn to live out of your cortex. Don't do what you're feeling. Do what you know is healthy. So meet your 12 needs. Fulfill your responsibilities. Keep connecting. Keep loving. So important. And then find activities that feed your soul. So what you might find is activities that used to feed your soul and make you feel more positive and help you grow. When you hit times of darkness, those activities might not feed your soul any longer. They just don't work anymore. And so what you're going to do is have to find new things that feed your soul. And I've gone through that. And that's part of this disorienting process. And what was important for me was gradually, and it took time to figure out what fed my soul in those dark times. And so for some, music becomes really important in dark times. Nature becomes important. Being with animals or pets feeds their soul and becomes important. Reading biographies, doing a hobby like art, all of those can feed your soul. Find out what feeds your soul. It is so important. So dark nights, they come. Everybody will go through it. They are not fun. But if we have the right tools, the right understanding, the right support, it can turn into a great time of healing and growth. And I hope you've at least gone through it once to know that to be true. But I hope this will help you, encourage you, as you continue on your recovery journey. Well, that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break and come back for the Christian part. If that doesn't interest you, again, you're free to go. That's fine with us. For everybody else, we'll be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. I want to talk a little bit about spiritual bypassing in connection with, there's a lot of spiritual bypassing, if you haven't thought of it, that's related to this dark night of the soul stuff. It's almost like churches don't want people to ever experience dark nights of the soul. In fact, if you look at many churches today, sadly, in the West, Basically, they would be what you call high-power solar events. They just want it to be constant sunshine. Talk of nothing but sunshine. They want to bypass the dark night of the soul. And what can come out of that is people begin to think that they should constantly walk in sunshine. That if they go into any darkness... It should only be for a really, really short time, and then they should get back into the sunshine. And if they stay in darkness for very long at all, then they've done something bad. They either don't have enough faith, they must have sinned in some way, they're not very spiritual, because spiritual people are in constant sunshine. There's a book, if you're interested in reading it, by Barbara Brown Taylor called Learning to Walk in the Dark. And it is just an excellent book on challenging this whole western high power solar church mentality and I want to talk kind of 
what she shared in that book. I just found it wonderful. Um, so basically, it's this. The church today, sadly, kind of approaches darkness this way. And it's part of it's good, part of it's true, but it's not the full picture. And I want to end by giving you a fuller picture. But the church has used darkness as only a metaphor of negatives. So death is seen as darkness. Loss is seen as darkness. Evil, Satan, sin, darkness. Painful, negative events. You're in a dark time. Dark emotions are bad emotions. It's all things bad, all things negative. That's darkness. And that's kind of how they've lumped it. And then to kind of build their theory, they basically go to opposed binary thinking, opposed pairs. So there's good, evil, light, darkness. That's proof that darkness is evil. Then they go, there's sacred and secular. So sacred is the light. Everything secular is kind of dark. And that's what they begin to do. And then... Light comes from God, darkness, no, that's not from God, that's why it's evil. And the proof of that is God is light, and him is no darkness at all. So light is of God, light is good, darkness must be evil. And so there's just this whole kind of theology that is developed to try to make darkness as a bad thing. And so then that leads to well, then spiritual means you're sunny all the time. So great spirituality equals sunny spirituality. So you constantly feel a sense of God's presence. You don't have any doubts in your life. You have unfaltering faith in God all the time. You have constant joy. You're certain all the time. You have constant guidance. You have reliable answers to prayer. All of this equals you are spiritual. You have full solar faith. And that, if you stop and think about it, is sadly what many churches present. So that leads to a question. Is that really what the Bible says? And yes, the Bible does at times use darkness as a metaphor for evil. It uses darkness as a metaphor for ignorance. But it's not the only way it uses darkness. That's what I want you to see. So let me show you some of the other things that it talks about in the Bible about darkness. Do you realize if you were to read through the Bible... Many great spiritual experiences of the heroes of our faith took place in the dark, in literal darkness and in figurative darkness. Abraham, he went through a time of doubt, darkness, metaphorical darkness. And what did God do? He took him out into literal darkness and he said, look up at the stars. And that was a turning point in his life metaphorical darkness and physical darkness. God did something deep in his heart because of that. Jacob had his dream where he saw the ladder to heaven in the dark. Jacob wrestled with God and it was a turning point in his life in the dark. Joseph had dreams that led his life in the dark. The exodus from Egypt out of slavery took place in the dark physical and metaphorical. God parted the Red Sea at night. Manna fell at night. Jesus' birth and the events afterwards at night. Jesus escaped to Egypt at night. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness, metaphorical darkness. Right before Calvary, Jesus went through deep metaphorical darkness. Some of the greatest events in history took place in the dark. Another way to look at that is some of the greatest changes in history took place in the desert. Moses, Elijah, Jesus, Paul, 
Four men that changed history. Their greatest change, the desert. Darkness, metaphorical darkness. The most important things of our faith happened at night. That is important to understand. But, let me give you something else the Bible says that hopefully just helps you think this through a little bit further. I would say in the Bible that great spirituality is not solar spirituality, constant light. Great spirituality is lunar spirituality. And what do you find with the moon? It waxes and wanes. You have a full moon, but then you have no moon, or a sliver of the moon, or a quarter of a moon, or a half moon. It's still the moon. It's still light, and that's spirituality. You get moments of full moon. You get moments of darkness. You get moments of slivers of light. So that is a more accurate picture of what normal spirituality looks like. But take it further. If you go into the characters of the Bible, the heroes of our faith, do you realize that every single one of them went through times of darkness as part of their growth? If you read the Psalms, what you're going to find is in the Lament Psalms that the normal part of the spiritual life is times of darkness, painful emotions that are not quickly or easily resolved. Lunar spirituality, not solar spirituality. Then if you look at Jesus' final week, much of it was darkness. The greatest events of Christianity, the greatest events of Jesus' life were in darkness. His birth, just before the resurrection. All of that is what the Bible shows. And so, yes, there's a type of darkness the Bible talks about that is evil. But there is a type of darkness the Bible talks about that is necessary, that is good, that is normal for every follower of God to go through. So beware of Christianity that says you should have solar spirituality that says that you should not have times of darkness. Because you want to know what solar spirituality is? It's basically saying you should be less human. Beware of any spirituality that tries to make you less human. Because what Jesus is saying is we are to be fully human. And that means times of darkness. And those times of darkness not only are they the reality, but they are the most healing, growing times of life. Let's pray. God, thank you. Though we don't like it, thank you for times of darkness. Thank you that you've shown that that's normal, that it's healthy. That's when you often work your greatest works. Save us from solar spirituality. Help those who are struggling, I pray. Amen. Well, that's the end of another Friday night. Thank you so much for being part of it. I just hope that it was helpful.